the film about? What's it really about? What genre does it hit? What is really being said? What's really being seen? That's what you're talking about. Hello and welcome to the Intermission Podcast. This is a podcast about pop culture and I assure you, we are going to make a podcast you can't refuse to binge listen to. We are two friends, great fans of all good content, be it movies, television shows, TV commercials, TikTok videos, awards shows, top 10 lists, you name it. Podcast, podcast, let's not forget podcast. Sorry. Oh yes, of course, podcast as well. I, Nitin Sundar, am the amateur half of this podcast panel and I ask that you listen on and we'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Time then to say hello to my big friend, uh, Narendra Banad, also known as Dodi. Unlike me, Dodi is an expert in pop culture. He consumes more content than you knew existed and has also worked in the entertainment industry in various capacities. Hello, Dodi. I can't wait to get our podcast started. How are you doing? Hi, Nitin. Thank you for the warm intro. Uh, Super excited. Uh, Something that uh, we've been talking about for a while. So uh, uh, excited to get started. Let's see where this goes. All great podcasts start off on WhatsApp and uh, eventually then make their way (laughs) to the audio waves. So uh, very glad that we have also taken the step after exchanging notes for many, many uh, years now on WhatsApp. We are recording episode one of the show today on Thursday, September 29th, 2022. I am currently based out of Dubai. Dodi is gracing the airways from the beautiful city of Lisbon. Our three-hour time difference is, of course, a tribute and a hat tip to the time gymnast, Christopher Nolan. You might have heard of him. <laughs> Let's go. What are we talking about today, Dodi? Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about one of our uh, favorite filmmakers, or a filmmaker who's dominated most of our conversations. Uh, Mani Ratnam! Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll come to him soon, but uh, we are talking about uh, Quentin Tarantino today. I do want to talk about why we chose to speak about him right now. On the one hand, uh, we followed his movies very closely. He dominates a lot of our conversations. Uh, but it also happens that uh, October 9th is the 30th anniversary of uh, Reservoir Dogs. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Yep. And uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino entering the zeitgeist, entering the mainstream and uh, pretty much dominating not just our conversations, but uh, pop culture conversations across the world. Uh, So it seemed like kind of a fitting time to talk about uh, Quentin. There's another reason, uh, there's another anniversary that I want to talk about. And uh, I'm just going to send you an email. I want you to react to this in real time and we'll see how it works. Just give me a second. There's something that just came through. It is basically a copy of... It's an old mail that you had. It's, a, it's our conversation that we're using. Don't read aloud, but read the mail and see the date. Oh, this is some old see. email, is it? Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> it says, okay, it's September 28th. Okay, this is an email thread between Dodi and me from September 28th, 2012. So that's exactly 10 years back. Uh, so it's basically me saying, uh, hey, you know what? Uh, we both listen to podcasts. We both do a lot of these conversations. Ah. Why don't we start a podcast together? So, so, you know, this is a conversation that has been percolating for about 10 years and uh, it seems about, yeah, (laughs) who would have done? And it's, uh, we have now come down to 10 years later, but we finally launched. So, better late than never, I guess. Yeah. Fantastic. (laughs) You know, so Bollywood and uh, Indian cinema generally has made this whole anniversary concept, uh, you know, they've taken it to the absolute extreme. So, you have... Three years of uh, yeah, yeah. Jane Dushman or yeah, yeah. two point Random two and a half numbers. years of two and a half years of Hero Panti or you know Tiger or whatever movie which you you'll be like this this movie actually released I thought it was yet to come out and then they're like oh they're celebrating an anniversary but yeah this is very worthy I think uh, uh, both the email that uh, Dodi and me have uh, shared from ten years back and of course Quentin Tarantino as they yeah. say in uh, in tamil right if you're starting something new you put a pulayar suri which is basically ah. you invoke the blessings of lord ganesh the first yeah, time you do yes. something right uh, quentin tarantino yes. very much the uh, the pulayar yeah. suri for this podcast so yes let us celebrate tarantino let's let's go for it
Okay, so let's start with, uh, I actually want to first just uh, warm up. Let's, uh, I want to ask you a few questions. I have a small little quiz about Quentin Ooh, Tarantino. Okay. Okay. Quizzing Tarantino. <laughs> yes. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So which movie of Quentin's has the most, we know that Quentin is, uh, uh, is known for his uh, dialogue and especially for his creative use of uh, swearing and uh, various permutations of the F word and uh, yeah. motherfucker and everything else. Uh, so which movie has the most uh, swear words? Uh, I Come on. I'm going to say Reservoir Dogs. No, Pulp Fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I should have gone with the obvious yeah. answer. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. Don't, don't overthink it. Just go with obvious answers. It's fine. Uh, okay. And just like answer as uh, quickly as possible so, so we can just so, get So what is the uh, count? And that was my next question. Back-in. That was oh, my okay. next question. Do you want to, I mean, it's to the nearest hundred. So this is how wide okay. of a birth I'm going to get, correct? Uh, uh, we're going just for effort or uh, we're going for any form of uh, unparliamentary language? Does it really matter? Do you have two different counts? <laughs> <Just> <laughs> Actually, yeah. So okay. in Pulp so Fiction, how many swear words? To uh, the nearest hundred. Okay, 334. Not bad. 431. Ah, I went to 334 because there's a cricket connect to it. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Donald, just... Bradman. <laughs> Donald Bradman's <laughs> highest score. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, since we, sh- we are talking about cricket very quickly. So, Bradman made 333, if I remember right. Okay, I'll get pilloried if I get this wrong. But it was either 333 <laughs> or 334 many, many years back. And that remains... And the reason, the... Uh, sorry, and the reason Nathan's going to get pilloried for this is that uh, he hosts... <laughs> not only is he an eminent cricket journalist... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> he used to write for uh, uh, ESPN Kick Info and all of that. Uh, but he's also the host of the Bits and Pieces podcast, a podcast about cricket. Uh, Don Bradman, of course, the greatest uh, batsman to have ever played the game, arguably, uh, scored 333 for Australia many, many years back. And that remained the Australian record. The Australian record, mind you, because the world record, Brian Lara scored 375 and that also got broken uh, by Brian Lara himself uh, later on and all of that. Mm -hmm. But the Australian record remained with Bradman until this uh, fine day in 1997 uh, when Australia were playing Pakistan, in Pakistan. And Mark Taylor, who was the captain of the Australian team in that match, was on 333. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark Taylor declared the innings closed at that time. uh, and he said, I shall not go past the dawn. So anyway, so that's, that's the <laughs> famous uh, reference. Okay. Uh, mind you, later on, uh, Matthew Hayden, who I think was also part of an Australian team under Mark Taylor, was the person who eventually went past uh, you know, <laughs> Bradman. He scored 380 against Zimbabwe and so on and so forth. Anyway, so 400 like, and... Uh, respect and all you can do. <laughs> I'm, yes. I'm scoring. I'm going to dream 11 in my team. Anyway. Correct. So what was the nice. number? 420... 31. Uh, Big number. Big number, yeah. Okay, um, which, uh, third question, which movie of Quentin Tarantino's, and again, I'll just say the first thing that comes to your mind, which movie of Quentin Tarantino's has uh, zero lines of dialogue by a woman? Wow. Uh, Reservoir Dogs. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Uh, not, uh, not really Does it even have a woman on screen? I, the waitress. But, the but waitress. Does she say anything? Yeah, probably not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jean-Luc Godard, who was uh, one of the masters of the French New Wave cinema, what's his specific, uh, what does, uh, I mean, Quentin Tarantino has been a fan, so it's not, uh, you know, something as simple as that. Uh, but uh, Jean-Luc Godard uh, uh, contributes something very specific to Quentin Tarantino's uh, filmography and to his uh, filmmaking. No? Okay. I, would, I would rather let you. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so, uh, Jean-Luc Godard made a movie called Band Apart. Oh, yes. Of course. Yep. And that's and the production that's, company. Yeah. That's Quentin Tarantino's production company, a Band Apart. Okay. I would think a slightly more involved question, but uh, maybe uh, I, you might have noticed it. I know uh, you're a big fan of uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and you've also read the book. I've uh, been yeah. to read it. I haven't done it yet. Uh, but uh, here's one from there, which is... Uh, one of Rick Dalton's movies uh, that he does when he goes to Italy uh, is called Operation, I see you smiling, Operation Operazione, okay, Operazione Dynamite, which is a James Bond spin-off, uh, rip-off, sorry. Okay, and we see the poster on screen in the movie. Uh, who's the director of that movie? Uh, uh, it's also a real person, but 
there's a reason uh, why you would know this name antonio margarete yes okay yes. <laughs> margarete margarete yes yeah. uh, i didn't remember that by the way i went for an educated guess it's been a while since i saw uh-huh. once upon a time i would have definitely noticed it back then so, yeah yeah uh so going along with that uh, uh, do you remember what brad pitt's uh, uh, fake name was in uh, inglorious bastards uh I, no i forgot it now okay Uh, it's Enzo Gorlami. Enzo Gorlami, Gorla. of course. Gorla. Gorlami. Yeah. Uh, any idea why he picked uh, that name? Mm. I mean, it's obviously a tribute. Uh, Gorlami is the director of the original Inglorious Bastards, the Italian oh. movie. Oh, yes. Oh, so okay. It's kind of a I didn't even movie. know there was an Italian movie by the same yes. name. Yes, so it's it's uh, it's not a remake, but uh, he t- took the title from there, and that's an Enzo Gorlami movie. Okay, last one. Quentin Tarantino has directed five actors to Oscar nominations and wins. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you might want to uh, guess a few of them. I specifically want you to guess one at the end. But uh, uh, any easy things coming to mind of the five? I'd probably not get any of these right. But uh, Brad Pitt definitely for Once Upon a Time. Right? Wasn't he nominated? Yes. Uh, Sorry. So that's six. I have it wrong. Fine. Six. <laughs> <laughs> okay so i already got this answer right okay well done right. yeah. <laughs> so brad pitt uh, uma thurman i'm guessing for kill bill uh, yeah. we're talking just about actors right and not about yeah. uh, technicians yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, samuel jackson wild guess here <laughs> yes 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 okay. all fairly obvious ones yes okay all right uh, christopher uh, what's that guy's name the this guy, hans landa Land- yeah, yeah christopher waltz correct yeah he won uh, two Uh, Oscars. He's the only person yeah. to have won Oscars, I think. Yeah. Well, um, he and uh, Pitt. Yeah. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. No, no. No, he didn't. He wasn't. Okay. No. Yeah, I think. I think that's the first okay. one. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, John Travolta is another one. Okay. From cool. Quentin. So there's one more. Okay. Uh, okay. Who? Ah. Uh, uh, is I'd this specific... Christopher Walken from Pulp Fiction? No. For this is a specific one. question. precisely okay. made for you you might not even be able to name the actor himself you might not know the name of the actor but you should be able to recognize him this is uh, this connects to a bunch of other things that uh, uh, we tend to talk about it's from jackie brown robert de niro no no uh, okay uh, i tell you yeah uh, no. so you yeah, okay so what are the things you haven't rewatched uh, this time is jackie brown i can see yes. uh, okay so it's an actor called Richard Foster. Okay, so, he was nominated. All right. Yeah. The the disappearer from Breaking yeah. Bad. Yeah. Yeah, the vacuum yes. vacuum guy. Yeah. I forget the yeah. name of the character, but yeah, the disappearer slash vacuum uh, yeah. person. Yeah. Yeah. And Hoover he Max. passed. Yeah. Who am I? Say, and he passed away a few years ago as well. So I think that was one of the reasons why they even in the latter series uh, seasons yeah. of uh, Better Call Saul, they only had like. one way phone calls or you know yeah. this character being evoked through the card rather than him yeah. actually appearing and speaking in fact he uh, he died soon after uh, shooting for his part in el camino i think everyone should be glad that he was around to act in that movie because he does a good job yeah. over there and a great character from the breaking bad universe good to see him back on stage one last time yeah 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 great reference so i thought that uh, that would be something that really brought your two big uh, uh, loves together for the title oh i have i have more i have more yeah yeah, yeah, yeah you yes have. well as it transpires leonardo dicaprio did indeed win a nomination for once upon a time in hollywood the trivia that dodi had was a little dated so he actually missed all the once upon a time nominations and hence the mistake no worries uh, i have made him promise that he will be watching the complete works of t rajender as punishment so on with the show I watched a few of his movies in the last couple mm-hmm. of weeks so and I tried to also watch Reservoir Dogs uh, last night before we recorded I unfortunately couldn't watch too much of it because I ran out of time but I did watch the opening sequence right which literally is the first sequence or the first scene that uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino committed to to public viewing 
it's an interesting long monologue about madonna as like a virgin what i found interesting was uh, I, you probably know of this so lawrence tierney the grumpy old man who is mumbling to himself throughout that opening sequence yeah mm-hmm. uh, apparently uh, he and tarantino got into a massive uh, fisticuff during the shoot and uh, they literally came to blows uh, and i'm quoting tarantino here he described tierney as a complete lunatic by that time and he just needed to be sedated so uh, <laughs> Tarantino yeah. you know, not want to mince his words. <laughs> <laughs> not want to mince his words. A master of dialogue, as as we all know. So Tarantino hurried through his scenes in a week, and and by the end of it, they nearly came to blows. The entire unit apparently hated him. When uh, Tarantino sent him off, uh, apparently the entire cast applauded. Right. And aside, you could say that this is method acting, of course, because La- Lawrence Tierney is a grumpy, irritating old man in mm-hmm. the scene he plays as well, because he's mumbling something to himself, which nobody seems to understand. and it looks like he behaved exactly the same way on the set but this is the funny part that's exactly the role that lawrence tierney played in another glorious brush with pop culture now i'm going to throw it back to you dodi can you name what this was <laughs> grumbling <laughs> old man a grumpy grumbling old curmudgeonly old man and he played this role i'm sure you watched him play this role uh, probably more than once uh, it happened roughly a year before reservoir dogs 1991 if it helps you place it I'm going to say, and look, I can clearly remember his face. I can remember the way he grumbles as well. Uh, I'm going to say it has something to do with uh, Seinfeld and turning up. Go for it. Artists. You're in the right. You're right there. So he is Elaine Bennis' father. <laughs> Mr. Bennis. Well done. Mr. Bennis who uh, crushes George Costanza. This is the episode, The Jacket. Uh, mm-hmm. where uh, Jerry Seinfeld is eventually forced to wear his corduroy j- jacket yes. <laughs> and ruin it in the snow because uh, <laughs> he tries to wear it inside out and uh, Lawrence Kearney <laughs> doesn't approve of it. So, and, and okay, so there's more here, right? So after this falling out, Tarantino mm-hmm. was very worried for his career. Like right? roughly a week into his career, he felt, okay, I'm already done, right? One, I've uh, taken Panga with a senior actor and that's probably it. I'm not going to get another chance. But who comes in to smooth things out? The wolf. Harvey Keitel himself who also happens to be one of the producers of the movie and it al- almost leads me to believe that uh, the role Mr Wolf that he plays in Pulp Fiction was probably you know uh, Tarantino's way of saying thanks yeah. because he comes yeah. in as someone who smooths things out uh, on Pulp Fiction as well but yeah i think the character seems to be written in that way anyway uh, but yeah Keitel was i think uh, one of the uh, early uh, uh, champions of uh, Quentin i think he put up some yes. money for the movie as well and yeah. uh, i think it's fair to say uh, reservoir dogs at least the way it was made would not have gotten made if it wasn't for uh, kaitel and kaitel sport i kind of started revisiting his movies uh, i couldn't revisit all of them i think his average should be about 2 and 1/2 hours is what i'm guessing yeah. uh, so it took some work back in the day i hadn't seen reservoir dogs when it came out but i saw pulp fiction when it came out and uh, uh, pretty much everything else uh, till about kill bill i was uh, very much in thrall of uh, quentin tarantino i was a huge fan i was uh, all in i could uh, recite uh, the movies backwards and forwards even now when i watch pulp fiction and i'm watching it maybe after 10 years or so uh, even inconsequential bits of dialogue i could uh, remember before the character said you know not even the famous lines but uh, the random throwaway lines as well but i've had kind of a mixed relationship with uh, quentin in the last uh, i would say 10 years or so partly it's the fandom around uh, quentin one side of things is that can, he can do no wrong uh, that kind of rubs me uh, the wrong way so that's not on quentin to be fair i've also found that i haven't really enjoyed and i'm just talking about uh, the past i haven't really enjoyed his last few movies as much as i would like uh, django for example i can barely remember um Hateful Eight, I actually literally fell asleep in the theater. I don't know how much of the movie I missed. At some point, I woke up and it got and it finished. I don't know if I napped for two minutes or 20 minutes. I have no idea, but I just completely fell asleep. That being said, I quite enjoyed uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And uh, Inglorious Bastards, I thought, was his uh, real, uh, it's at least the my favorite of his movies that he watched right now as well. And I still think that's... Uh, Uh, so far the pinnacle of his uh, movie as making lieutenant, as lieutenant adorain says this yes. might just be my masterpiece exactly yes. exactly uh, uh, but uh, as i was rewatching now i started to make more of a distinction between uh, quentin the director and quentin the uh, writer okay uh, and uh, you know i think i'm he's far more consistent as a director than he's a writer 
uh, his uh, this whole approach of the chapters uh, that he does in i would say pretty much every movie is yeah. maybe only jackie brown doesn't have chapters i'm not sure yeah um, i can pretty much pick chapters that work and chapters that don't work in each of the movies right so for me at least yeah. I, i realize now in hindsight and i mean pulp fiction at the time i loved the movie inside out i loved it all through uh, but this time when i watched it they were uh, chapters in it that i was just didn't really work for me uh, yeah. some of the dialogue was a bit over stylized it's written in a very particular quentin tarantino voice i did find that there were scenes where uh, or uh, chapters where i was uh, much less uh, impressed now than i was back in the day um, that being said chapters like the vincent vega takes uh, mia wallace out for the, the dinner and yeah you know something like that i would say seems a little out of place within a movie that's about crime but it does lead <laughs> yeah. to you know but it does uh, touch upon various little uh, quentin uh, quirks and uh, Oh, uh, there are crimes that are uh, committed in that sequence as well. Yeah, yeah. To be fair, it's not uh, completely <laughs> distant, uh, distanced yeah. from the rest of the movie. But yeah, you know, it plays a little differently. That's a sequence I completely love. That entire chapter. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you noticed this. Uh, at least I noticed this time. There's so much music in that segment. Yes. There's almost yes. three full songs when he enters yeah. the house and uh, yeah. she's watching on the cameras. Uh, I think it's Son of a Preacher Man there. it pretty much plays all through so i have a spotify playlist where i curate a lot of stuff that i listen to mm-hmm. on pop culture so it has a lot of songs from breaking bad universe for instance yeah. uh, quite a bit of tarantino as well so when i was rewatching pulp fiction i i you know i, I listen to the music i like yeah. it i added to spotify i don't really remember where it where came from. picked it up from so yeah. so when i was rewatching pulp fiction this time i was like hey yes. you know uh, insert leonardo dicaprio <laughs> looking at the screen yeah. gif yes, <laughs> but uh, yeah that mm-hmm. reaction in fact as, uh, i i felt uh, you know the approach of using chapters i i really like that because it's it's a great way to ensure at least parts of your movie work well right yeah. uh, you're not putting the entire movie at risk because otherwise what happens is you're like hey, i didn't like the ending right yeah, yeah. with tarantino's movies yeah. there is no beginning and there's no ending right every chapter yeah. lives in breathes by itself and often times characters from one uh, chapter yeah. don't really interact at all with the other Mm-hmm. chapters and unlike say other uh, directors where they try and bring stories together and finish them off like inari 2 for instance with mm-hmm. uh, babel as an example tarantino doesn't try to do that very often the chapters are just independent stories that you know you just stop wherever they have to stop right at their logical yeah. end point so yeah. so I, i i like the approach uh, i like the approach for me at least there's clearly chapters that do work and yes. chapters that no. don't you know no uh, no absolutely and i yeah. i think it's a good idea exactly it's for a, that reason because, yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. uh yeah. and this brings me to even the fact that he's a far better short storyteller yes than yeah. he is uh, a I, coherent have you seen four rooms i have not but yeah that uh-huh. that okay. i think should work perfectly right it's a, it is yeah. him doing one uh, sequence Uh, but even like Inglourious Basterds, right, where I my absolute favorite of his movies, and that's something I've rewatched uh, a number of times, and again rewatch now. And this time I was paying a little more attention because I know we wanted to talk about it. The chapters that don't work are all the Basterds chapters. Literally everything that Brad Pitt somehow just doesn't work for me. <laughs> everything that Shoshana is doing from the first one, yeah, uh, yeah. where she's literally I, only there yeah. in the end. I think I, the only in fact, the one the one sequence that I really liked with the Basterds was the you know the rendezvous. Yeah, they're on the, the bastards are only like tangentially available in that sequence, but yeah, yeah that's a fantastic sequence. Yeah, the, you're talking about. But the, but I agree with you. The yeah. bar, the tavern, whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, that, yeah. See, that's a great sequence, and that's yes. a sequence that stands on its own, uh, even without the rest of the movie. Same for Absolutely. the yeah. same for the opening uh, interrogation of uh, yes. Monsieur Lapadit, right? Yeah, uh, Monsieur Lapadit. Can I have some of your milk, please? Yes. <laughs> same for that sequence it works amazingly yeah. well as a uh, short story as a or as a vignette but doesn't really uh, yeah. i don't know that it doesn't but uh, for me it doesn't uh, all of these pieces don't always fully come together that being said uh, yeah. i think for inglorious at least uh, uh, the through line of shashana and how she goes through the entire story and she has the ending for me that worked a lot better Uh, but yeah he sees yeah. uh, far better at sequences and at shorter storytelling uh, shorter uh, capsules than he is at kind of this overall cohesive uh, bringing yeah. everything together yeah. yeah 
Yeah. Yeah, fully agree. Uh, I, I, we should go into uh, Inglourious yeah. in, in some more detail, seeing mm-hmm. as that's one of the movies I too watched uh, and, and loved a lot. But yeah. I just wanted to spend a moment on, uh, on the dialogue mm-hmm. that Tarantino writes, right? Uh, I would argue that he's the best dialogue writer out there. I know that you said, you know, some of the dialogue is overindulgent, it's hyper-stylized, but I like it exactly for that reason. All of Tarantino's movies are situated in this hyper-realist space, right? It's not, mm-hmm. he's not trying to be realistic in anything he does, right? Yeah. You're watching his movies for the spectacle and the the dialogue imbues a lot of that skip spectacle into it, yeah. right? It's, uh, it's funny, it's ironic, it's mm-hmm. uh, memorable, it's full of punchlines. And so on. In that sense, uh, I would posit that he's actually the opposite of uh, Christopher Nolan because Nolan uses dialogue purely for expo- exposition, yeah. right? And for nothing yeah. else. It's almost, I need dialogue here. I am literally abuse the dialogue here so that I can explain what's going on to yeah. my, to my viewers. And Tarantino uses dialogues entirely differently, right? That's, that's an interesting uh, contrast and, uh, yeah. and very sharp contrast that you picked up. Uh, Nolan also uses a lot of dialogue, but largely it's very much... Yeah. Exposition it's, dump, or it's for information. There's it's no for information, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, to be fair, even the stylization that I'm now complaining about, uh, when I first watched them, I was all in on this. I think just my tastes have changed a little bit. It's obviously something that works. Uh, it used to be something no, that fact, I loved completely. Uh, yeah. No, and, I, let me put it this way, right? Uh, if every movie were a Tarantino movie, I would probably not be able to take it. I am yeah. as much a fan of Nolan as I am of Tarantino, right? yeah. despite the fact that I diss his dialogue yes. writing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right and and of other movie makers who make uh, realistic movies with realistic dialogue right you need yeah. all of them but nobody does tarantino as well as tarantino does and and he does yeah. he does a great job of it right and the dialogue is a huge part of that for me absolutely uh, i agree that uh, yeah you know even now when i rewatched uh, kill bill or for that matter inglorious uh, all of his dialogue is clearly his like you can tell from a mile away that this is a quentin tarantino line so you yeah. know, he's got that signature style. His ear for, I would say, the rhythms of dialogue, you know, the way yeah. it goes up, down and moves around uh, the space, the room and the scene itself. I think he's yeah. uh, uh, very few people are at that scale. Let's not use the word good dialogue, but writing dialogue in this style also then means is it, it puts a lot of emphasis and focus on the actors because yeah. if they're not able to carry off that dialogue right mm-hmm. and if their characters are able to not able to carry off yeah. those dialogues they wouldn't work at all mm-hmm. and and hence you have some of these incredibly memorable characters right yeah. from from the tarantino universe and uh, yeah and i think great actors you know chewing the yeah. scenery with brilliant yeah. lines very often mm-hmm. makes for good good cinema you yeah, add he, you add music and kitsch to it it, it works <laughs> he right. gives them a lot of space to play and one of the things i noted this time when i watched uh, pulp fiction especially is that the performances are simply out of this world. Even uh, John Travolta doing, uh, you know, the whole, uh, he's constantly, uh, let's say, under the influence of uh, one or the other substance, or uh, Uma Thurman in the entire uh, date, dinner date uh, sequence. I mean, obviously, they're all good actors, and obviously, he's a good director, but uh, he gives actors the space to play around with his dialogue he gives them the space to uh, uh, really make uh, make it uh, their own and i think that uh, that was something that really worked for me now uh, something that i didn't notice earlier i have a lot more i think respect for him as a director of actors because i always used to just think of him as a director of uh, style or mood and yeah. uh, uh, aided very much by the way he writes and the, you know the bombastic action sequences the mexican standoffs the uh, stylized dialogue the a quintessential uh, Quentin uh, voice. Quintessential this... Tarantino. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Since we are uh, on a frivolous point, and huh. I'm sure you saw this. Uh, I don't know if you saw this uh, COVID joke. Yes, okay. I was going to say that, but I thought it's... <laughs> I sent it to you, I think, if I'm not wrong. Uh, probably, I'm sure yeah. you probably did, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah Tentin yeah. Quarantino, just to yeah. see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd agree with you that uh, Inglorious Bastards is right up there. Right. In fact, for me, it would be tough to uh, make a pick between Pulp Fiction and Inglorious Bastards. Rewatched both of them and both hold up superbly for me. Enjoyed every minute of both the movies. What I really liked about Inglorious Bastards was uh, all the commentary that came out when the movie released was around mm-hmm. the fact that uh, you know revisionist uh, history, uh, yeah. you know, and what he's done with history over there and all of that. 
I thought that was basically a very smart publicity stunt, right? I almost think that the entire revisionist history piece was like a Trojan horse within mm-hmm. which uh, Tarantino tried and mounted a movie that was trying to do something entirely, uh, something else altogether, right? Yeah. And I did read uh, what Roger Ebert had to write about uh, Inglorious Bastards. Ebert loved the movie. Mm-hmm. And he pointed out that this movie, every single frame of it is actually a celebration of cinema. Uh, and if you think about mm-hmm. it, right, uh, right from the opening scene, which is, uh, you know, yeah. out of Unforgiven, right? It's the same mm-hmm. scene. And uh, there yeah. is another scene where as uh, Soshana runs away. The searchers. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, exactly. It's a frame from the searchers and so on. But there most is more, used, right? uh, generally most referenced frame anywhere, right? It's, oh, is that? It's even okay. in Kill Bill when uh, she's walking out of the chapel and he's... Uh, Ah, okay. He's playing right. flute, yes. and it's not just him, right. uh, not just everyone uh, does it. Quentin. Yeah. Everybody does. like it's literally yeah. one of the most famous. It's there in every Star yeah. Wars movie. Say everywhere. Anyway, yeah, sorry, go yeah. ahead. Even beyond that, right? The movie is so much about the movies. Every yeah. single character in the movie is playing <laughs> someone else at various points in the movie, right? Yeah. Uh, so Shana, for instance, is leading a double life. Zoller, the the soldier on whom mm-hmm. the movie is made, plays the role Himself. of Zoller in yeah. his own movie. You can see that Hitler is very concerned about how the world is perceiving him and not so much about, uh, you know, what actually is happening in the war. So the reason he's very irritated with Aldorain and, uh, you know, the bushwalkers is because of uh, the fact that they are projecting a story of German incompetence or Nazi yeah. incompetence because they're yeah. going and collecting scalps. And the, the bastards themselves, yeah. the power of perception, right? Yeah. And, and the bastards themselves are basically launching propaganda, right? Because yeah. behind enemy lines, they are yeah. out there to to send a message that's far more than the hundred scalps yeah. or whatever that they're yeah. collecting. There's so In many fact, examples, the right? The, the bad is, Jew, right? Yeah. But yeah, exactly. cinema's propaganda is, I mean, you're from Tamil Nadu. We know that uh, uh, cinema's <laughs> yes. propaganda is a big enough thing there. Exactly. Uh, then there's more, right? You have the actress who is helping the allies while yeah. actually being German and She's an actor who is also acting in real life. Of course, uh, there is Christopher Waltz who is also playing a character, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you can see how easily he's, he's happy to slip uh, or yeah. rather change loyalties when he sees that it is. Which is, which is exactly what a perfect actor would do. Right? Yeah. He's, yeah. He goes from one role to another because it suits him better mm-hmm. and so on. Yeah. One reading of Inglorious Bastards is that is a war movie, but it really is a movie about films. Uh, so yeah, even I wanted to talk kind of around that as well. The real hero of Inglorious Bastards is... Cinema. It's yes. literally uh, you're using cinema to right the wrongs of the past. Yes. Right. Everything's happening inside that cinema. The ammunition that they're using is yes. film Silver reels. Silver nitrate. Right? Exactly. Yeah, they're yeah. using film reels. So it's he's uh, completely, uh, you know, given over to this idea that cinema is what's going to save us, and I will use cinema to correct or right historical wrongs. And that's kind of what he's doing, even in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as well. Yes. You know, he yeah. gives that whole uh, sequence in the theater where she's watching uh, footage of uh, uh, Sharon Tate. Yeah, Sharon she's Tate. watching uh, footage of the original actors. Uh, even the climax, for that matter, it largely works yes. because this guy's a stuntman yeah. and uh, uh, Brad Pitt's, uh, uh, Leo's character goes and picks up a prop from one of his movies and uses that to vanquish the quote-unquote villains in the uh, uh, final yeah. sequence. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, yeah, it's it's... I think it a little bit ties back to his love of cinema and all of that. He's using, exactly. he's basically yeah. talking about, you know, how does cinema really help save us? How, mm-hmm. how can we use cinema or film to uh, make an impact and make a change? And, uh, to, com- to communicate further and uh, more impactfully yeah. than in any other, uh, you know, any other medium, any other tool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Even in Inglorious, um, Shoshana could very well have just lit everything on fire and be done with it. But yeah. she you, she shoots a movie within that she wants yes. to talk about. She wants to be on the big screen saying, this is the end of all of you. And yeah. I want you all to remember that it was this little girl who did who did this yeah. and burnt it out. Right? He's, uh, he's moved a lot over to the uh, foregrounding the idea that uh, yeah. uh, cinema can save us or cinema can uh, write a particular type of wrong. And I think that's what I've found very interesting both about uh, Inglorious as well as uh, Once Upon a Time. Since you're talking about Once Upon a Time, I went for that movie without knowing anything about the Sharon Tate murders or knowing yeah. that this movie is about that. So imagine I watched that whole movie and I'm, I'm reasonably in it, right? I find it interesting, but uh, that final sequence you had no idea it was for me. I have no idea what's happening. So then I go back and read 
ah so that's charlie manson and this is yeah. uh, sharon tate and this is what actually happened yeah. and hence i enjoyed the movie a lot more the second time mm-hmm. i watched it and then i read the book as well which is yeah. fantastic by the way yeah uh, tell us so, a bit about the book uh, i don't remember enough to say more about it but <laughs> it it lives in the universe of the the book itself so think of it as there is a lot more happening between the scenes and uh, behind the scenes in once mm-hmm. upon a time in hollywood the movie and uh, the book basically brings all of that to life right so this yeah. for instance the conversation between the agent played by al pacino and uh, and leonardo dicaprio right mm-hmm. uh, about and 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 how the insecurities that rick dalton has about his own future about his acting career etc you have a lot of depth going into that there is no doubt at the end of the book as to whether cliff booth murdered his wife <laughs> on the boat or not right the movie of course leaves it open ended yeah. uh, did he get away with it or uh, what exactly happened uh, was it an accident or not etc but in this movie in the book i think you get a clear answer uh, i don't want to spoil the answer for people who want to read the book uh-huh. I, I, a great book right and again the, the dialogue really sparkles a lot more i would say on paper because sometimes especially to us indians at least to me sometimes the dialogue is not intelligible so i yeah. use subtitles quite a mm-hmm. bit in fact i struggled to watch hateful eight a couple of days back because mm-hmm. i had a superb uh, 4d print of it but without subtitles right and uh-huh. i literally opened the subtitles or other script on my phone <laughs> and i kept looking at it because there is absolutely no way yeah. you can understand what uh, domog you is trying to say <laughs> uh, <laughs> right otherwise uh, i i quite like that movie but i thought it was a good companion piece mm-hmm. to reservoir dogs you get a bunch of baddies in a room and uh, it's mm-hmm. uh, basically you know who's going to survive uh, who's not going to make it yeah. yeah it was it's not a tarantino original i think it was a it's based on a book by uh, elmer leonard or someone else and uh, it's an adaptation so i guess to that extent it's not a tarantino original but uh, it it sort of works for me i agree it's not up there with his best work yeah. even reservoir dogs is actually the last 10 minutes of a hong kong movie called city on fire uh with uh, Kante isn't it isn't it a remake yeah. of Kante yeah. Kante <laughs> by the way is a more straight remake of uh, City on Fire than uh, ah, okay you see this he just takes the last like 15 minutes uh, and uh, blows that out into a whole movie and it it's got all of the same Chow Yun Fat plays a uh, plays the main uh, undercover cop and it's a story of the cop actually the entire movie is about the cop and how he gets into infiltrates and everything and the end is he's uh, this entire sequence of uh, uh, that one mexican stand off that happens in that room and uh, right. people trying to believe or not believe and uh, somebody taking uh, his side as a uh, older wiser person and there's one crazy nut who's uh, uh, ready to blow everything up but you know he makes all of this his own and uh, that's yeah. true in pretty much everything and uh, sorry just coming back to even when he talks about his influences he talks about and these movies have been telling you and uh, your brother about as well Uh, a bunch of these John Woo, uh, what they were called heroic bloodshed movies, hmm. which are Chow Yun Fat, uh, mostly uh, directed by John uh, Woo. Either he's playing a gangster, he's playing a straight up cop, or he's playing like a undercover cop where he's kind of on both sides of the things. And all of these uh, uh, genuine, uh, generally get uh, cited in uh, any of Quentin's, you know, uh, uh, most influential movies that influenced him or, you know, movies that people should watch from the 80s or the 90s or whatever. uh but even when it comes to any of the uh, kill bill he does a lot of repurposing and reimagining older things to fit in so i am glad i am glad nobody accuses him of exactly. copying the way they do it yeah. in india right which is it's yeah. like i mean come because on because you got you, can you have to add something of your own and quentin in fact says this also somewhere i i don't have the quote in front of me but he talks about everything is an inspiration from something else you know you talk about something being an original idea but it is shaped by everything you've read watched seen heard whatever uh, so you know there's no uh, original germ of an idea everything comes from somewhere else and uh, you know people haven't seen these movies or whatever or even they have uh, they, he makes them his own and i think that's uh, that's a skill that he has that uh, maybe others need to uh, learn if watching yeah. uh, reservoir dogs makes you go and watch city on fire that's a plus if watching uh, uh, kill bill 2 makes you go and watch uh, uh, all of the old westerns that's a plus so he i think actively tries to allow for uh, fans of his movies to watch uh, the movies that inspired him as well hey everyone we ended up chatting for a really long time so we decided to break this up into two episodes It seems only fitting that our debut episode needs an intermission. See what I did there? 
come back next week for part 2 of this conversation about Quentin Tarantino have a great week